the order. More headlines in about 30 minutes. The O'Reilly Factor starts right now. Coming up, Bill is joined by Senator Orrin Hatch. That's right here on the Network America Trust for Fair and Balanced News, the Fox News Channel. Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly reporting from Los Angeles. Thanks for watching us tonight. The UN humiliates the USA. That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. No way the Bush administration can spin this. If America does not call for a UN mandate authorizing force against Saddam as the president promised, it will be a major defeat for Mr. Bush. America's intentions were good. The USA hoped the world would see Saddam's defiance of 18 UN mandates it was unacceptable in a world that is supposed to be fighting against terror. But President Bush miscalculated. He did not see how strong anti-American feeling is in countries like France, Germany, and Syria. And he did not understand how venal politicians would pander to those who hate America. In hindsight, Mr. Bush should have done what President Clinton did with Milosevic, attack him without UN approval. You remember that France opposed bombing Serbia, even though soldiers from that country were committing mass murder throughout the Balkans. Mr. Clinton, to his credit, ignored French objections and bombed Belgrade. But President Bush was persuaded to take the diplomatic road on Saddam, and that has failed dismally. Once again, even after the UN passed Resolution 1441 last November, demanding that Saddam account for his weapons of mass destruction, the UN will not force him to do so. That's what this is all about, the UN not backing up its mandates with force. It is frustrating for those of us who see Saddam for what he is, a killer with huge stocks of anthrax and other deadly weapons, to constantly hear that more time is needed to disarm the man. If all the so-called civilized nations of the world would enforce 1441, Saddam would already be out of power. We have said that many times before. But logic is not in play in the UN. Anti-Americanism is. And thus President Bush has been humiliated. So what now? Well, Mr. Bush and the leaders of Britain and Spain will meet in the Azores on Sunday, and soon after that, Saddam will receive an ultimatum to disarm, and soon after that, the Allied forces will remove him from power if he does not account for his weapons. What nobody knows is what will happen after Saddam is removed, and it could be one giant mess, made worse by the fact that the image of the UN is now pitted squarely against Mr. Bush. These are very difficult times for all of us here in America, but again, we must do the right thing. Saddam is evil and a threat to the world. He must go. But the Bush administration must also learn a lesson from this debacle and either repair relationships with powerful countries or make it quite clear to the world that we will fight alone against dangerous tyrants and terrorists if we have to. The USA cannot straddle the middle ground any longer. And that's a memo. Now for the top story tonight, two other points of view on the UN versus America. Joining us from Washington is Utah Senator Orrin Hatch, who is close to the Bush administration. Am I going wrong here, Senator? Yeah, I think so. I think to a degree. Now, you're right in, uh, in the vast majority of what you're saying, but to a degree you're wrong about President Bush because he's acting with principle and he's acting with guts. Principle because he's tried uh, to, uh, to go through the so-called world body, the UN, and it appears that the UN is uh, turning into a spineless uh, debating society that is unwilling to enforce its own resolutions, 17 of them to date. And, um, and you know, with the makeup of the current National Security Council, uh, uh, it's been very difficult to get them to, uh, to do anything. And of course, with guts, because he's made it very clear that if, uh, if they can't get the Security Council to act in an appropriate manner, then uh, he's going he's gonna to go in there with the allies that he has who go into, into it with a coalition of the willing. So All right, but look, I don't, I don't think, I he don't made think a tremendous he's... miscalculation with the United Nations, though. Why even bother going to that body if you're going to get soundly thrumped like we were and, well, thought... uh, or we are being? I mean, it seems to me that if I'm you and you're the savviest senator on the Hill, you don't go in with a bill you know is going to get beaten if you don't have the, the, the votes to get it in. You work it, and if you're not going to get it, you bring it back again some other time or something like that. Here, now, the high moral ground that the United States should have has been lost because the United Nations can say, hey, America, you're an outlaw nation. You're outside the UN. We don't want this action. Well, they can't do that because they, they passed uh, Resolution 1441 and the other resolutions ever since 1991. Been, so then uh, but why bother going back at all? We well, should have just did. taken 1441 and rammed it down Saddam's throat. <laughs> well, two words, Tony Blair. I mean, let's face it, uh, uh, Tony Blair has been a, a valiant uh, 
supporter of uh, President Bush and what we're trying to do here. He recognizes the dangers over in Iraq, and they thought they would do the very best they could. Okay, now, but they lost, the, Senator. You look, well, Blair didn't yeah. get help by this either. Blair's weaker think, now I, than he would have been if they went in two, three weeks ago, you know? I, I don't everybody, think everybody lost here, including the I don't, country. No, I don't agree with that. I don't think anybody's devastated because that National Security Council, with that makeup, with France, Germany, Russia, and China uh, certainly enjoying the United States' uh, uh, discomfort, I don't think anybody's lost. I think it's just made it very clear that an effort was made to work through the U.N. Now, if the French uh, succeed in, in basically disemboweling the, uh, the U.N., and making it really what it is, a spineless debating society that never enforces its own resolutions, well, th then the UN's going to have to live with it. I would like to see it go. Uh, I, I would like to have seen us uh, at least get a majority of the Security Council and then have the French uh, veto it so that everybody will know that they're the ones that uh, All right, but then again, look, destroyed the UN. If you're, if, look, Senator, here's what I'm worried about. You know, in yeah. theory, you and I agree. The UN That's is right. spineless. It's anti-American. It's... it's uh, uh, fronting uh, for a dictator, keeping a killer in power. We all, nobody can disagree with any of that, all right? However, you got the President of the United States. He gives a press conference. He looks into the camera and he tells Americans, we're going to go to get another UN mandate to go in and use force, and if we lose, we lose. And then now yeah, he's not going to do thing. that because he knows he's going to lose. That undermines his authority and credibility, Senator. There's no question about that. I don't think so. I don't think it does. I think it just shows that the U.N. isn't going to do what the U.N. is set up to do. Well, then why did he say it in the first resolution. place? Why, why well, did he say it in the first place if he wasn't going to do it? Well, I believe that they are close to having a majority, but I think it looks like it's going to be very difficult to happen. I think he, it's a matter of principle. He tried his very best to get it done. Uh, it's not his fault that some of these countries are unwilling to do uh, what really is clear uh, they should do. And it's certainly not his fault that uh, France and Germany and, uh, and Russia and even China are enjoying some discomfort. It is discomfort not his here. fault. What is his fault right. is that his administration has miscalculated the United Nations guile. And he oh, put think... himself out on a limb and said, I'm going to go in and I'm going to call for that quorum. And now he may not. And that's a loss for us. Well, I don't think it is, because I think he's, what he's doing, and everybody in the world knows it, is trying to do what, uh, what his friend, Tony Blair, who has really stood tall in this matter, has asked him to do. So, you know, that's a matter of principle to him. But right, it's also a matter that, of guts. I mean, you know, right. he could have he just taken the easy way out and said, look, we don't need the U.N. Final he's question. he's tried to work within the world uh, framework. Final question. You know and I know that if we go after Saddam without the U.N. behind us, it is going, we are going to be called an outlaw nation, all right? I all over the so. world, the anti-American press, which is 80% of the press, is going to say, America is an outlaw. That's not good, Senator. Well, they're going to say that no matter what you do, because they do not believe in, uh, in world stability. They don't believe that we should do anything about these weapons of mass destruction, which everybody knows he has. He has thousands of liters of anthrax. We know that it's the pure type anthrax that, uh, uh, that could really cause devastation. He has thousands of uh, liters of botulinum uh, toxic uh, uh, chemical yeah, we weapons. Yeah, we know all that. We know it. Look, and, and biological weapons. I just think they booted it di diplomatically. And, uh, you know, President Clinton, I, I supported so. his bombing. He just thumbed his nose at the French and went boom right in there. It's probably well, what we should have done. Well, right. you got some points there. And all I can say is that, uh, look, I think uh, we ought to give Clinton... Clinton has credit, and we ought to give Bush his credit for well, acting on principle and acting on guts. And he's see how now going to have to Senator, always guts. a pleasure to see you. Thanks very much. Nice Next, another point of view, somebody who supports the U.N. Also, later, did the police botch the Elizabeth Smart investigation? Right back with those reports. Talking Points is brought to you by Morgan Stanley. No spin zone on the O'Reilly Factor, the most powerful name in news, Fox News Channel. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Bill O'Reilly. In the personal story segment tonight, the French continue to hammer the USA over the Iraq situation. And a poll on my website, BillOReilly.com, says that Americans overwhelmingly want some payback. More than 50,000 people have responded to the Internet poll, and 93% support boycotting French goods. Just 6% are opposed. Because of the growing anti-French feeling in the USA, the Sofitel hotel chain has lowered the French flag from its American properties. But... We encourage Americans to stay at the Sofitel or other French business properties that are staffed by Americans because we don't want to hurt our own countrymen. 
So what I am calling for is a boycott of French goods in the stores. For example, if you buy Poland Spring bottled water instead of Evian, the store still gets the money. The question is, will a citizen's boycott be effective? Joining us now from Washington is John Magnus, an international trade attorney. And from San Diego, Stephen Moore, the president of the Club for Growth. Mr. Moore, I talked with you on the radio today. You believe that the boycott will be effective. How? Well, I applaud you for what you're doing and, and leading this boycott, uh, and count me as a supporter of it, Bill. You know, we have bailed out France now three times in this century, in, in World War I and World War II, and, and then in the Cold War. And, and so France really does owe us a debt of gratitude. They should be a strong ally of U.S. and European national security. And yet what you have here is France undermining the national security of a country that's supposed to be a friend and an ally. And so what, uh, what I support, and I think what you support too, Bill, is the idea that Americans voluntarily, and we're not talking about the government involvement Correct. one bit, but Americans voluntarily taking little pieces of patriotism by boycotting French goods until France changes its opinion uh, and its uh, position on the, uh, the war with Iraq and ousting Saddam okay. Hussein. The, and that the, means uh, not buying French perfume, not buying French champagne, and products that uh, will enrich the French people. All right, now we have uh, bottled water, we have right. uh, a lot of uh, clothing, a lot of perfume, a lot of uh, lingerie. You know, and they're getting a dicey area right. here, Mr. Moore, with the lingerie. <laughs> but anyway, um, do you agree with me that we shouldn't be punishing the hotel chains, like Motel 6? is owned by a French conglomerate. I don't want them to turn the light off uh, because then the franchisees in America get hurt. So I just want well, people to... I, I, Go ahead. I was just going to say, I would extend it to any French product. After all, you can always go to an American hotel and, no, and that's going to create more American No, but I don't want to put those American people out of job. business. I just don't want to put them out That's true, but you know, if you choose an American hotel, you're putting more Americans to work than if you choose mm -hmm. a French one. The main impact, by the way, that Bill that Americans can influence the, the French economy and issue their patriotic act of prote protest is to not go to France for vacation. That's right. Because France is extremely right. dependent on American tourists in the spring and summer 2.9 million, seasons. Mr. Moore, last year. That was down 20%. Yep. And I say it's going to be down another 50%. I think it'll be um, down at least a million. Now, Mr. Uh, Magnus, how do you see this? Well, I think the problem is that it's not quite as easy as, as it might seem. Uh, particularly, as you pointed out, it would make sense to focus on French goods, but the uh, vast bulk of what France sends to us uh, is not identifiably French by the time it gets to consumers and it would be very difficult to catch with a boycott. Uh, you can get perfume, you can get alcoholic beverages, but the vast bulk of their exports are things like intermediate products, engine parts, chemicals, things that are uh, uh, that turn into other products that you cannot, uh, the All information... Right. Well, a quarter of the French imports to the United States. And we ought to point out that France makes $9 billion a year in profit in trade with us. $9 billion, and we're their fifth largest trade partner. But a quarter of the trade is with the aerospace industry. We buy their Airbuses. So, Mr. Magnus, I'm saying that we shouldn't buy their Airbuses, that our airlines should not order those and should go with Boeing. Am I wrong? The Airbuses are assembled in a number of different countries and the component parts are also coming from a number of different countries, in some cases manufactured in the United States. So it's not an entirely simple thing to say this is a French product that you could boycott. There's a good deal of U.S. value added and value added from, from some of our key allies such as the United Kingdom in those kinds of products. That's why it's very difficult to take a product approach and make a boycott work. Yes, there's some low-hanging fruit and you can impose some economic pain on France, but then I think you have to ask yourself, what do you hope to accomplish with that? And do you believe that it really stands any chance of turning around their behavior in the Security well, Council? What it does is that it punishes Jacques Chirac's government for its obnoxious stance and its anti-Americanism in putting us all in danger. Now, because I have no... Do you, you don't have a problem with that, Mr. Magnus, walking into a store and taking Poland Spring instead of Evian, do you? None at all, but I wouldn't kid myself that this is going to turn around their behavior in the Security Council. Well, no. I think that uh, has it motivations... Isn't. This is that, payback. This isn't yeah. trying to influence policy. This is payback. Okay, you know, then, I think then in that case, Bill. in that case, it seems to me you should you should also think about the long-term harm that could be caused. You have a transatlantic relationship that is important to us, that's in very bad straits right now, and uh, the long-term effects that that nobody can even imagine right now of what would happen of a reciprocal boycott. And I think it would be reciprocal if it really well, we got traction. Well, you know, but I'm who, willing to take that but chance. John, who's 
who's doing the damage here to the relationship between France and the United States? They are supposed to be an ally of ours. Our national security is potentially at stake with respect to Saddam Hussein. They're and when, not when France like does not ally. come to our rescue, I think it's perfectly appropriate. And John, you and I are both free traders. I'm very much in promoting free trade. I don't want the government to get involved in telling Americans they can't buy these products. But I think voluntarily, Americans saying we're not going to buy French products. And the real issue is where do the profits go? You're right that a lot of these products are produced all over the world. But in, for the most part, when you're buying a French product, the the profits are going to French companies. I think this will hurt them in the pocketbook, and I think well, it, it has could to. change the, the, their The French behavior. economy is only growing 1% a year. Right. All right? You have 50 million Americans, and I believe 50 million will get on the citizen boycott, Mr. Magnus. If 50 million Americans say, uh-uh, no way I'm buying any retail products from France, because as you said, a lot of things we can't know about, and I, I simply don't want to hurt the uh, franchisees. But if they, they don't buy uh, the uh, perfume, and they don't buy the champagne, and they don't buy the escargot, Cargo imported, it gonna, that's going to put them into a recession because they're almost there now, Mr. Magnus. It will be very satisfying. It will cause some economic pain in France. It will cause some industries in France to squeal to their government. You bet. But it will not change the course of their government's policy. And what it would risk doing is aggravating what's already a very bad problem in the bilateral relationship. My no, view is that commerce over the long haul ought to be part of the healing process that actually addresses some but of the But the healing process, out. Mr. Magnus, with all due respect, can only begin when the fairness process kicks in. Gentlemen, thanks very much. Very interesting discussion. Of course, we'll let everybody make up their own mind. We are keeping the poll open on BillOReilly.com over the weekend. We are going to forward the results of that poll to the French Embassy in Washington on Monday. When we come back from L.A., an outrageous story right here in Southern California. College professor gives students extra credit for writing anti-war letters. That right after these announcements. Time now for the most ridiculous item of the day. Your humble correspondent, that's me, in case you didn't know, appeared with Jay Leno last night. Here's a highlight. It comes down to this. I respect dissent. I respect people who don't want war. I do. But they got 8,500 liters of anthrax unaccounted for, and he won't say where they are, he being Saddam. Right, right. Unacceptable. All right, 10 letters shut this country down, shut D.C. down. Right. We'd have shut my building in Fox down. NBC Tom Brokaw's secretary got sure, six. Sure. 8,500 liters of anthrax, and this clown will not say where he got it. Yeah. Now, how many, how many more mandates do we got to give this guy until we send him a little message, which Secretary of State Leno is going to do? Well, let me ask you this. Now, <laughs> did you say, uh, I'm not sure if you said it, when Dan Rather was there to interview him, why didn't he just kill him? Was it you that said that? That's what he said. <laughs> that wasn't me. I didn't. I'm a nonviolent person. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Suppose someone said, Saddam Hussein knows that you're the number one cable channel. Saddam Hussein wants you to interview him. You think I, Saddam wants no, to no, go no, into the no I said, here's a pen. This right. pen is filled with Jab poison. In the eye? No, just, just spray it and he'll... Would you kill him? <laughs> I mean, it's for, it's for the greater good. I it say, is. put this in your pocket. You pull this. You and he both blow the kingdom. Oh, I got to go too? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, there's got to be something in it for us. Right. Oh, yeah, no. You would do it? I would do it. He would do it. There you it. go. All right. I think Jay wants to get rid of me. Ridiculous? You make the call. And finally tonight, the mail. We like to thank Jay Leno anyway. We always have a good time when we go on with him. Uh, about the Smart case. Scott Cannon, Fairfield, Connecticut. It's not my intention to rain on the Elizabeth Smart homecoming parade, but why is it that the media hasn't mentioned word one? about her parents hiring vagrants off the street to do odd jobs around her house. Well, Mr. Cannon, the media has to be very sensitive in this case. We did report when the girl was kidnapped that it was not wise to hire strangers to work in your home, but using that as a hammer on the smart family would not be smart. Joe Benko, Keyport, New Jersey. Bill loved the factor, but I did not like your knocking of the police in the smart case. I am sure they are competent. We didn't knock anybody, Mr. Benko. We questioned. Joe Allen, Macon, Georgia. I am a firefighter and was offended that law enforcement tried to take credit for the return of that child. The truth is that the media and the family were the ones that got her back, not the police. Chris Powers, West New York, New Jersey, crediting prayer 
for the return of Elizabeth Smart is an insult to anyone who's ever had a tragedy befall their family that did not end so happily. Vicki Butler, Germany. Mr. Oma, military spouse stationed here. I must admit, I've enjoyed going to France, but I will not any longer. Mark Travers, Miami. Hey, Bill, stop bashing France. Don't forget that 40% of Americans agree with the French approach of dealing with Saddam. But, Mr. Travers, very few Americans are trying to undermine the USA in the struggle France is. Tony Relier, Richmond, Virginia. Bill, just saw you on Leno. Looks like Jay has a no-spin zone of his own. Dana Johnson, Hubbard, Ohio. Bill, your appearance with Jay was very patriotic and inspiring. I am forwarding the interview to my friends overseas. Well, thank you, Dana. I appreciate that. It was a good time. And how about that website? If you want to get in on the uh, French boycott, and listen, if you don't believe it's right, we want to hear from you. Right now, it's 93 to 6. So you guys out there who don't believe that boycott is right, go to BillOReilly.com, which you can access right off our website here. All right? So go to our website here, then there's a click right over, and it gets to the French Embassy on Monday. Also, please email us with pithy comments, O'Reilly at FoxNews.com, O'Reilly at FoxNews.com. Name in town, name in town, name in town. If you wish to opine. And that is it for us today. As always, we thank you for watching The Factor, Radio Factor every day on Westwood One. We've had a great time here in Southern California. I want to thank everybody at the Fox lot here who made our stay so enjoyable. I'll be back on Monday in New York in the cold weather. Hannity and Combs is up next. Latest on a smart case. I'm Bill O'Reilly. Hope to see you next, next time. And remember, the spin stops right here. And welcome to Hannity and Combs this Friday night.